We're today entering into Romans chapter 6, and we're, uh, before we do, I would like to read some of the previous verses from the last chapter because it jumps into a question in, in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, but just want to make this statement. I'm sure you're already aware of it, but the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. Uh, the the letters the uh, the gospels it was all one uh, one piece of work but for the ease of reference they put in chapters and verse so really this is just a continued flow and so that's why there's chapter and verse but I'd like to begin in the in the latter part of chapter five. Let's start with verse uh, 17. I'm not going to make much comment on it, but I just want to do it so that we're not just jumping abruptly in, into the first verse of uh, chapter 6. It says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, and we're talking about Adam, much more those who received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. There is a comparison between Christ and Adam, the first Adam being uh, Ad the Adam of Adam and Eve, and the last Adam being Jesus Christ. There's also going, uh, we're comparing the, the law and grace. He talks about in verse 18, he says, therefore, uh, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. And just to give you a, a simple definition of justification, which we've already talked about, but I just want to reiterate it, is justification through salvation means just as if I had never sinned. So if you don't sin, you're not held guilty. If you haven't sinned, there's no condemnation. So through the gift of righteousness that came through trusting in Jesus Christ, there is justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound. The law, and we'll talk about this in this chapter, but the law is, is not unholy and it's not wrong, it is holy, it's righteous. It's the flashlight that reveals the snake in the basement. When you turn on the light, then you begin to see what's, what's hiding there. So moreover, the law, uh, the law entered that the offense might abound or be made manifest, but where sin abounds, grace does much, grace abounds much more. And I want you to notice that, that there is a greater power in grace. Because when grace entered in, then uh, it, says, it says grace abounded much more. And so he says, so, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says, what shall we say then? It's a question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Some people have said, well, you're just giving people a license to sin. The reality is, is people have never needed a license to sin. Adam sinned before there was a law, except the law of don't, don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, people, people respond by what's in them. It's just the law just brings, uh, just shows you what's already on the inside of you. 
And then he answers that question. He says, certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? And one thing I've, uh, I've seen through reading these chapters is that Paul uh, explains later on in the chapter. So I'll lightly touch on it, but he will show he will he will give a clear explanation as to why he says what he says. So again, he says uh, in verse one, he says, "What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound?" Verse two, certainly not. How shall we, we who we, we who? We who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are now identified with Christ. We're not identified with the first Adam. We're identified with the last Adam. God sees us not in the Adam who fell, but in the last Adam who overcame sin. He says, Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ were baptized unto his death? So again, remember, as we accept Christ, we are identified in everything that Christ did. I'm going to use this word, but its I don't think it's the best word, but I think it would help explain it. What Christ did was attributed to us. But according to the scripture, when Christ died, we died. When Christ, uh, when Christ uh, was baptized, we were baptized. When Christ rose again from, when Christ was buried, we were buried. When Christ rose again from the dead, we rose again from the dead. That's kind of hard for us to think about because we think of we think of it in natural terms. But the reality is, is the natural world is only temporary. The spiritual world is eternal. And so what Christ did for us and what, and what we receive through the world of the Spirit is something that is eternal. The temporal is only temporary. The spiritual world is eternal. So again in verse 4, or if I haven't gotten there, he says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism unto death. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about when we accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit, through his work on the inside of us, baptized us into Christ. We are a part of the body of Christ spiritually. And that's the way God sees it. God sees us as in the body of Christ because by faith we have believed what God did. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to, to him for righteousness, we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Therefore, it, therefore because of that faith, uh, righteousness is attributed to to us. So therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we should also walk in newness of life. So he's telling us here that as Christ was raised from the dead, we are also raised from the dead. Instead of living under the law and being controlled by the law of sin that was on the inside of us, we are freed from the law of sin so that we can live by the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us who leads us into righteousness and gives us the gift of righteousness. So, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Now, if you believe, if you want to keep on believing this, go ahead. But you know, I uh, I used to hear a teaching about, oh, you've got to crucify the flesh. And so you're constantly, constantly, constantly trying to overpower something that Jesus has already overpowered. 
You are believing for something that God's already given you. He says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified, was is past tense. Paul said it this way in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And so as we are identified with Christ, we also are crucified with Christ, but we live also through Christ, through his life in us. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now, he's going to, he's going to uh, explain this later on, but let me just say this. When you died to sin, you are freed from it. A dead man doesn't sin. When you die to sin, you're freed from sin. He goes on to say in verse 7, He who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we, verse 8, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. You know, sometimes it's a little hard for us to believe in things we can't see, but the reality is, is faith, believes in what God says before we see it manifested in the natural or in the flesh. We believe that we were crucified with Christ. We believe that by his stripes we were healed. Sometimes we believe it before we see it manifested in our flesh. We believe that our God supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We believe it before we actually see it. The Bible says, when you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. That doesn't mean I give $5 in the offering plate and take out 20. No, you wait for the reality of God to speak to people or to open, he's not going to float down money from heaven. There's going to be opportunities for you to receive, whether it's from some individual or from an opportunity that arises that you can profit from it. Not all of, our, not of, all, not all of our increase is going to come from other people. Sometimes God's going to open up opportunities for you to step into, but if you're if you're looking for, if you're looking in all these other places, but you might miss the door that God's opened for you. So I just encourage you, as the Bible says, those who are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. So we have to yield. Just as uh, Peter was was asked by the tax collectors, does your does your leader Jesus pay the temple tax? And of course, he answered yes. And so while he was thinking about that, he comes into the presence of Jesus and Jesus, Jesus talks to him about it. And then he says, go, go down to the shore, cast your line, and the first fish that comes along, open up its mouth and you'll find a coin there. Go pay your tax and mine. You know what? You would never thought of that in your own natural imagination. You would have never looked at that on a book and said, oh, all I got to do is go fishing. Some people just go fishing anyway. But no, you have, to be, you have to be led by God because God is going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think in it and in ways that you might not, not even think of. Let's get going here. So again in verse 7, for he who has died has been free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We are just as Christ was resurrected from the dead when we die physically. We're not dead spiritually, but we die physically. Our bodies will be raised again. Actually, we will have glorified bodies just like Jesus, we, we won't have to worry about dieting. We won't have to worry about getting old. We won't have to worry about aches and pains because we will have a glorified body that is filled with eternal life. 
He says in verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. You say, oh, isn't that wonderful? But how about me? Let's keep reading. He says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Let me ask you a question. Whose sin did he die for? He died for your sin. He had no sin. So what he did is going to be attributed to us. His death on the cross as a sinless lamb of God paid the penalty for what we did. And so all of the, all of the not the benefits, but all of the um, wages of sin, sickness, lack, poverty, spiritual death, all of that was paid for so that we now can receive eternal life. He goes on to say, likewise, you also reckon or count yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. I used to, I remember years ago, I used to, um, I found that scripture and I, you know, because I was struggling I used to go around and say, oh, I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to sin. Well, you know what? You need to confess the whole verse because I started feeling like I was dead. I had no life. My joy was drained out. But I went back and I read the rest of the verse. He says, therefore, reckon yourselves uh, yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now I am alive to God. And I don't have to focus on sin. I have to focus on my, on my life and resurrection in Christ. I have a future resurrection of my physical body, but I have an inward resurrection of my spirit man. And you have an inward resurrection. When you accept Christ, you are a new creature in Christ. That new creature in Christ is your resurrected spirit, the spirit of life. He goes on to say, therefore, because of what he just said, therefore, let not sin reign in your mortal body. Oh, that's a real struggle, Pastor. I've been, I've been dealing with it. Well, you don't have to deal with it. You just have to focus. When sin tries to lure you away, then you just start confessing and believing and looking to what Christ has done. Start confessing that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Start believing and confessing that you have the holy spirit on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit is not an unholy spirit. He is the Holy Spirit of God that helps you to ward off the powers of darkness. You know, everybody has thoughts. Everybody has temptations, but when they come, I the best thing to do is not to dwell on them, is to turn our focus to what Christ has done. Because, the, and as we, if we get to the end of the chapter, it says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. What do I want to live in? Death or life? Eternal life. Well, of course. And uh, uh, don't have time for a story now, but the reality is, is eternal life is now. You ha when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have eternal life right now. Right now. You don't wait until you get to heaven to find out if you have eternal life. It might be a little too late. No, you find out now. These signs I write unto you, John said, that you might know that you have eternal life if, because you believe on the name of Jesus. Verse 13, he said, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. There was an old song, probably you might, if, if you're as old as me, you, you would remember a rock, a rock singer by the name of Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan uh, at one point got saved and he wrote a song that says, you've got to serve somebody. It might be the devil and it might be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. And so you have a choice 
you have a choice. And even after you've gotten saved, even after eternal life has come into you, you still have to make the choice that I'm not going to linger. I'm not going to linger and submit myself to sin. Sometimes people get weak. Sometimes people fall. Sometimes people are lured away. It could be by looking at things, could by, be by listening to others. It could be by letting your imagination and your thoughts run rampant. It could be because, could be because you remember somebody, somebody from your past. You know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people, they think about their old flame when they were in high school. That's about the stupidest thing you can do because they don't look like they did when they were in high school. The reality is, is if you've got, if you've got a good marriage, you better just hang on to it. Why did I get off on that? He says in verse 14, this is the power of the gospel. He says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, sin has been dethroned in your life. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What is he talking? The law is, again, the law is not wrong. The law just shows you the sin, the sin that, you, uh, that you've yielded to. So what do I do? Focus on the law or do I focus on grace? I focus on grace. I focus that Christ paid the penalty for my sin, and I have now, because I believe, I receive a gift of righteousness. Why do I want to go back to the old life? You know, Satan always makes sin look great. But when you bite into the fruit, it's rotten. It is rotten to the core. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. He answers his own question. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? You have a choice. You have a choice. Do you want life? Or do you want death? Remember, Satan will always make death look, look good. But, the, you know, when you go to a funeral, they have death dressed up probably better than sometimes they've ever been dressed in their whole lives. But the reality is, it's death and decaying. Okay? He says... Verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed, obeyed from the heart. There is a depth in your heart. It's not, just a, it's not just a mental ascent, but you obeyed in your heart. He says that form of doctrine or that form of teaching to which you were delivered the teaching of Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and rose again, and continue in the teaching because there's more than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's just to get you started. He says, And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Now, you know, God, if you have received Christ as your Savior, God is your Father. God's your Father. Of course, we want to serve Him, but the reality is, is God's our Father. As a matter of fact, the Scripture says that we are to call Him Abba Father, Daddy. It is a loving term of endearment. Verse 19, he says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more unlawlessness. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. 
So what, whoever you submit yourself to, you're going to reap the fruit of it. If you submit yourself to sin, you reap death. If you submit yourself to holiness, you reap righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is, is right standing with God. Look at the, read the book of Judges. Every time the Israelites moved away from God, they got into poverty, sickness. They got into slavery to other kingdoms. But as soon as they started worshiping God, they repented. God restored them. They began to prosper. Their kingdom, their kingdom arose. That's what righteousness does. You're not suppressed when you are a slave of righteousness. The prodigal son learned that. When he left the father, he got into poverty. When he came back to the father, he was restored. Robe of righteousness, a ring on the finger, which meant authority. He was given sandals. Slaves don't wear shoes. They killed the fatted calf. The fatted calf was for honored guest. He says in verse 20, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. But what fruit then did you have of the things which you are now ashamed of? When, do, you, do you remember when you were in sin, when you were ashamed of the things you did? Sin brings shame. Righteousness brings an honoring from the Father. And not, only, and not only does sin bring shame, it says this, for the end of those things is death. And then he says in verse 23, which is two, two verses, he says the wages of sin is death. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I came that you might have a life and life more abundantly. Verse 22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. It's not just living forever. It is the joys of all that life brings. Have you ever heard a testimony of somebody that died went to heaven and came back. They didn't want to come back. They told about the glories and the beauties and the love and everything that was waiting for us, the brilliance of the colors, the, the wonders of the smells that they, and everything had life in it. As a matter of fact, the, the Bible talks about in Revelation, there's a river that runs through through it, it's the tree of life, and on each side of, uh, not, not the river of life, I'm sorry, the river of life, and planted on each side of the river is the trees of life. And the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Isn't that wonderful? But then he goes on to say, he said, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you accept Christ, you haven't given up anything. Yeah, you did. You gave up death. You gave up fear. You gave up demonic control over your life. You gave up poverty, sickness, and spiritual. Well, I still experience it. The Bible says that we are to walk by faith, and we can stand believing that God is going to restore you know, Jesus said to pray, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're not, we're not experiencing all that God wants us to. God want, has more for us. So I just speak blessing over your life in the name of Jesus. I hope this encouraged you. But the reality is, is I hope it encourages you to study the Bible more for yourself. I remember being under the, the teaching of Kenneth Hagin, and he says, I'm not going to do all of your studying for you. And he said, this here is just a platform to release you. So I hope that you yearn for and long for the Word. You say, well, I don't understand the Word. Well, just keep reading it because the Holy Spirit 
is going to be your teacher. God bless you in the name of Jesus. You are an overcomer in Christ as you walk in righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.